Welcome. Everything is great. You're listening to Fork and Bullshit, the Good Place podcast. I'm Jason. And I'm Vivian. And we'll be the architects of your journey into the afterlife. This week we're talking about Season 2, Episode 9, Leap to Faith. This episode was written by Christopher Ensel, directed by Linda Mendoza, and it aired January 4th, 2018. Woo, guys! It's the new year! Welcome to 2018. We're in the future. Jetpacks, flying cars, floating houses. Floating houses? I don't know. Sure, why not? Okay. (laughs) Sounds good. (laughs) So let's just get right into it. Sean is jubilant with the results of Michael's plan and offers him a promotion. Michael and Sean reveal the true nature of the neighborhood to the four humans, who pretend to be shocked. Sean announces that the neighborhood will be shut down and the humans will be sent to the real bad place. So, this reveal is so boring compared to all the other ones. It kind of is. Yeah. So boring. I mean, I think it's supposed to be. I don't think we were supposed to have like a, what? Oh my god! kind of reaction to it, so. It just feels very half-assed. Hmm. It's a little bit of a bait and switch because... Right at the end of last episode, in our mid-season finale, we got that moment of, oh my god, what's going to happen? Is Sean gonna know about all the reboots? Is Michael gonna get fired or retired? Whatever. Mm -hmm. And then it's just kind of like, oh no, I'm actually happy with your work. Of course. Which, it's not bad, it's just not great. They kind of subverted our expectations a little bit. If you weren't expecting to be subverted in the first place. And a lot of people pointed out that it was Michael's reports that Sean was reading. So really, this could have gone a few different ways. And this is probably the best way for it to actually go. Even if the reveal was kind of meh. Like after watching it a few times, you really watch Michael's expressions and... Our four humans' expressions, like, this is the bad place. No way. What? I don't know. It's just, yeah. Yeah. Part of their reactions and Sean's reaction makes me wonder if he's really buying this or if he's trying to trick Michael. Because the four humans have, like, almost no reaction. Eleanor's like, what? We're in the bad place? And then Tahani just says, why are you telling us this now? But there's almost no reaction from Chidi and from Jason, which you would expect, I would think. I don't know. To me, Sean, well, Sean, we know, is awful at expressions. That's true. Or showing emotion or anything. So perhaps he just doesn't understand it. So that could really play a factor. So maybe for him, Eleanor's reaction was like excessive. Yeah, he right? was about to cocoon himself, basically. Oh, okay. I yeah, get it. Totally. I really like that Sean takes credit for this project that he has no part in because it's not his idea at all. None of this was his idea. He was trying to shoot it down, and now he's like, I'm going to be, you know, on the head council now because of our idea. It's typical upper management taking credit for your, you know, your underlings work. Ah. It's just, you know, crap rolls downhill and the people get promotions above you when you do good work. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're like, oh, you manage them well. Yeah. So. You must have guided them really well. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It just, it's, it's, it was a nice little moment because. I mean, this is the bad place after all. And it is basically, seems like a corporation or like a business. Very much so. So it's got to be run like one. Yeah. So Sean says at this moment that the humans are experiencing emotional torture at the same level as physical torture in the real bad place. So do we think that it's been greatly exaggerated in Michael's reports? Or do you think they're actually experiencing a high level of emotional torture? Yeah, I was thinking about that. Because if they're experiencing the equivalent of physical torture, then they're not really getting tortured that badly. What do you mean? Because, I mean, he says... Physical torture can be, like, really bad. He literally says... Emotional torture to the equivalent of some of our squiggliest eyeball corkscrews. Yeah, literally corkscrews shoved into your eyeballs. You don't think that's going to hurt? So what I'm saying is what emotional torture is Michael saying they're going through? 
Mm. Like, well, what emotional torture could be as bad as corkscrews in your eyeballs? Well, Eleanor trying to become a better person, but being bad at it. I mean, I'd take Cheating, that over being annoyed. eyeball corkscrews any day. Well, yeah, obviously. I don't want things in my eyes. So to answer your question, Michael's probably exaggerating a lot in his reports. Mm. Okay. Like, Cheaty hates Eleanor kind of thing. and Eleanor can't stand Cheaty, but needs him. And there's also the acupuncture. Like, there could be a lot of other things that they've been doing that we haven't seen. That's true. Okay. I'm going to say he definitely exaggerated oh, yeah, a little. Oh, yeah, for sure. For <laughs> sure. Yeah. Okay. Which is kind of interesting. Like, there's Sean, you'd think that he'd want to maybe f- do some fact checking. Nah. Look, look back that, in some no. video footage. Do you think there's video footage other than the VHS? I guess because Michael's in charge of it. So mm. I guess he just trusts him. Yeah, I guess. So Sean says that they're going to greatly expand the neighborhood project. And that's kind of cool to think about because that would most likely mean more humans, right? Yeah. Like a bigger neighborhood so that more humans could be there. So yeah. instead of four, maybe doubling it up or even tripling, quadrupling, whatever. Mm-hmm. That could be interesting. It could be interesting. Because it could mean that the show would have like all new cast members next season. That could be a premise for season three right there. Yeah. Expanding the neighborhood. Definitely. Tagline for season three, the good place, the neighborhood's expansion. I don't really think that they're going to go in that direction because you can't keep doing this show, but just with more humans, right? You got to at like least the last move man in a direction. Earth. That's like what happened with Last Man on Earth. They just kept adding more people to the show. Mm. Last Man on Earth. Oh, wait, there's another woman. Oh, wait, there's another guy. Oh, there's another woman, et cetera, et cetera, ad nauseum. Yeah. But for this, because it's like a fantasy type show then you have to do something else with it right right is it fantasy is it supernatural i don't know science fiction is it sci-fi i don't know writers out there let me know what is the good place fantasy sci-fi supernatural you did have a dragon in this episode um it was not a dragon i actually paused and it was a flying three-headed bear like we had heard of it before okay yeah yeah. My bad. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. No, it 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 went by insanely fast. That puts but... it under the fantasy realm. Okay. Well, there maybe there are fantasy elements, but it's a... I don't feel like it's sci-fi. Okay. Another thing I liked is that we get that little second beat with Michael where he says, this is everything I've ever wanted. Because it's super obvious at that moment that Michael's not going to go along with Sean's plan. At least to me. Like... During the mid-season finale, I really thought maybe something was going on. Like, maybe he wasn't going to be on their side Mm -hmm. when things went down. But I saw it so plainly at the beginning of this episode that the little twist wasn't a surprise at all. Right. It was totally expected. Yeah. So, what you mentioned, when Sean says, this is everything you've ever wanted, and when Michael repeats it, To me, it's like him realizing, crap, this is everything I've ever wanted, but Mm -hmm. things have changed now. I've changed. This is everything I used to want? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's how I read it, too. Mm -hmm. And just seeing that disappointment in his face and in his, like, hearing it in his voice just made me realize he's not going to go through with this. He doesn't actually care that much about being senior staff anymore. Not if it means actually hurting people that he cares about. Right. We get to meet the new Janet. (laughs) Janet on magnets. Janet on magnets. Is that new favorite Janet or do we still like... I think I still love just regular Janet best, but drunk on magnets Janet is pretty amazing. Yeah, she's great. Yeah. I really love the little chuckle she has right at the end of the scene. And when she's like, I'm supposed to be drunk, but I feel fine. (laughs) I was like, yeah. (laughs) They're always finding new ways to get Darcy Carden to be amazing. Oh, she's fantastic. The four humans discuss options. Tell Sean about all the reboots or escape to the medium place. 
Eleanor offers a third option. Assume Michael is still on their side and await his plan. She suggests they take a leap of faith. Okay, so Tahani's name dropping in this episode might be my favorite in the entire series. Because the way she says, guess what, Tahani, I'm going to be Batman. (laughs) It's so good. It's so funny. And then later when she mentions Russell Crowe getting the wrong tea, she has this look in her eyes like she has witnessed true horror. And it's perfect. It's so good. It is really good. I I don't really care about the Kira Sedgwick person or the... That's an actress on Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Michael Schur's other show. Oh, yeah. No, I know. I just... I I don't care for the name drop. Oh, okay. Um, Because that one's kind of like, eh, whatever. Or the Pippa Middleton, I suppose, said name drop. I don't know. Uh, (laughs) Both of those are kind of whatever. But the Russell Crowe and the Bet Affleck one is really good. Four name drops this episode. Yeah, four. And the last one is like, really, Tahani? Really? Let's go is what you said to her? That was so important. Mm Mm-hmm. Another thing I noticed in this scene is Eleanor's outfit. Because she's wearing this peach cardigan that's just... It's not great. And I'm not saying that Kristen Bell can't pull off, like, anything. Because I'm sure you could just put her in, like, a garbage bag and she'd make it look fantastic. But the peach cardigan is very close to her actual skin tone, so it was kind of a weird outfit. And That's then, what you were focusing on in oh, this scene. Yes, I, I'm in part of this scene, I did focus on the cardigan. Um, because it reminded me of a comment that I read on Reddit or Tumblr. I really can't remember. I did try to find it. Um, that pointed out that all of Eleanor's clothing in The Good Place must be the real Eleanor's clothes, right? Right. So she's always wearing somebody else's outfits. Mm-hmm. So all the outfits that we see in the flashbacks show a very different sense of style, like much more youthful, less expensive, some might say kind of trashy. Yeah, a little bit. Right? So I'm just noticing her clothes much more often now and wondering if she's feeling like a different person, like wearing something that's a little bit different. I don't know. I think it also helps to delineate the two Eleanors, like, Alive Eleanor and now dead Eleanor, Mm -hmm. right? Different people. The cardigan would probably look a lot better on Vicky. Yeah. Yeah. Tahani. Right. Yeah. Although I don't know if Tahani would ever wear a cardigan. So enough of the good place fashion watch. Let's move on. What did you think of this scene? I liked it. Mm -hmm. It seemed... It's just frustrating watching it all happen the exact way you're anticipating the whole episode to go because you can kind of see where the episode's going as soon as you figure out that Michael is still on their side. Yeah. So you have to wait for your characters to reach that point. And it can kind of feel a little, Michael's on your side, figure it out. So So did you feel bored? Not bored, just, I don't know. Waiting? Yeah, I guess waiting. I mean, I still enjoyed everyone's banter and back and forth. And Mm -hmm. Jason, his hilarious, we should go to the cops. (laughs) And then I don't know whether anybody else thought about this. But as soon as they say, where do you think you are? I just thought of Scrubs. Oh, that's a sad one. Thank goodness we didn't get a little twist like that. I know. Okay. Um, But... I guess, yeah, just kind of waiting. Okay. Yeah, I get that. I felt like a lot of this episode was kind of like that. But I don't want to be too harsh either because I still think they did a good job because all the characters are very much in character. No one's breaking characters so that we can do this story. Everybody reacts the way that you expect them to react. Yes. Which... I guess on one side is a little dull, but on the other side is good storytelling or is consistent storytelling. Your characters are doing what they should. Yeah. But at the same time, they're doing exactly what you expect them to do. Mm -hmm. So 
at, at least Jason wasn't dumbed down too much. He was still kind of dumb, but he wasn't like, I don't yeah. know, ostrich in the sand dumb. Mm-hmm. So you called out Jason's comment about calling the cops, and that moment is hilarious. But also, it made me wonder if there is some kind of being that's equivalent to the police here. Like the ones who created Janet, the makers of light, darkness, and everything. Mm -hmm. Could they actually be like a mediator in this situation? Could they come in and lay down the law? Like... The universal law, I suppose. Someone between the good place and the bad place. A neutral zone? No, not a neutral zone, but like a neutral party. A a neutral being or entity. Yeah, yeah. So maybe Jason's comment is actually not that far off of what could happen this season. Although I think it defeats the purpose of this whole universe that's been created. Of the good place and the bad place. And there is only light and dark. They've said that. But if you times. had someone, the, the makers of light, darkness, and everything, then mm-hmm. you have people that are on both sides that are neutral because they don't prioritize. So you think one there, over the do, other. there you think there does exist something or being that exists in both the lightness and the darkness? Yes. Okay. It would be interesting. What if, like, they went on trial or something? I don't know. It could just be kind of cool. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking out loud here. They but just better not have bad Janet as their lawyer. I would just... Yes, good point. Because <laughs> all she's going to do is fart. fart. And that will be inadmissible as evidence. Um. Anyway, I'm basically just saying it out there. Because if in, like, two years from now we're watching season four and this happens... Then I can look back at this podcast and go, what, what? I called it. I'm going to have to disagree with you. I don't think there is a a neutral party. All righty. Watch yourself. They had to specifically create the medium place for Mindy. So I don't think that it has ever existed before the other two cases. But this is a place. Yes. You know, that's different than a being. A being is the creator. You know? Okay. Okay. So I do want to go over the leap of faith that we talk about several times in this episode. Just give a little bit of context, I guess. Not too much, though, because really, guys, it's pretty much on the surface. It is most commonly used as believing in something outside the boundaries of reason, right? So something that seems irrational, Like, believing that Michael is on your side when evidence shows that he's not. Well, this was used to explain religion and religious belief, uh, faith, right? It still is. Yeah, because faith is a completely irrational experience, and yet it is the highest duty of a Christian or a a Catholic, right? Because we're talking about specifically God here. Right, if God asks you to do something, you just Mm -hmm. do it. Yeah. And it is not supposed to be a spontaneous belief, but faith is nevertheless something blind, immediate, and decisive. Because Kierkegaard felt that a leap of faith was vital in accepting Christianity due to the paradoxes that exist in that religion. Basically, hey, it doesn't make sense, but still believe in it anyway. It's called a leap of faith for a reason. Exactly. The story that Kierkegaard talks about in his Fear and Trembling book is, of course, about Abraham and God asking him to kill his son. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So in that moment, you know, it's it's completely irrational to think that your God, who is meant to be, you know, all-powerful, all-knowing, loving, would ask you to sacrifice your only son. And yet, he believes, and so he does. What do you think about the inclusion of the leap of faith in this episode? Do you feel like it's kind of important? Do you feel like it's not that important? Oh, just give me your thoughts. I don't think it's important enough to dive into. I think they could have just said, we have to take a leap of faith. Yeah. We have to trust Michael because of the conversation I had with him because I believe him. 
Mm -hmm. And here are the clues that he left us. I think, I don't know. I think it was an important first clue because that's when Eleanor starts to feel like Michael is sending a message to her. Right. Because he very specifically mentioned Kierkegaard and not any other philosopher and probably because they had a lesson recently on a leap of faith or on fear and trembling where Chidi most likely mentioned a leap into faith, Mm -hmm. right? I guess I just don't feel like there's a whole lot of depth there. Um, It just feels like it can very easily be summarized by putting your faith into something that may seem nonsensical to others. So, mm. anyway, it's it's fine. It works for this episode. It does its job, you know? It's it's very much like the guy who goes to work gets his job done. That's what they do in this episode. <laughs> Multiple times. Yeah. Making sure we understand everything. Yep. 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 Okay, let's continue. Michael convinces Vicky not to tell Sean about the reboots. In the courtyard, Michael kicks off the celebration with a comedy roast of the four humans. After all the insults, the four humans doubt Michael's intentions. Meanwhile, Vicky is frustrated that she hasn't been promoted, and she suspects that Michael is betraying her. Okay. You immediately called this as soon as Michael was up there and he was like, hey, like, this is something that we created in the bad place. Like, you were immediately like, it's a roast. It's yep. a comedy roast. <laughs> yep, yep. You saw it coming a mile away. Oh, yeah. And the first clue that we get, the Derek Bortles, was so, so obvious. So obvious. But it was... I I don't know. Part of it, I feel like, was Ted Danson's delivery on that one. It was just super obvious. I was like, okay, I don't need to be force-fed. Like, I get it. We get it. It has to do with <laughs> Derek. They have to do something about Derek. Yeah, yeah. Um... But, I mean, it obviously worked, so that's good. Maybe. Well, he really had to dumb it down for the humans. But he really had to dumb it down for Jason. That's what I'm going to go with, you know? sure. He was like, I really have to give him an easy one. Just like a real low ball. (laughs) Just replace a first name. Yeah. I mean, I could have called him Derek instead, accidentally. Yeah. Derek? Oh, I mean, Jason. Yeah. That would have been even worse. Way worse. Way worse. Yeah. And then we get another little clue. Um, It's very subtle, but on the podium, there is a Latin phrase around the thumbs down seal that says something in Latin that I can't pronounce. (laughs) And I don't know any Latin, but it roughly translates to mockery of non-believers banquet. It's terrible or something like I fear the treacherous mockeries concerning the dinner guests. So, or something like Roast of the Sinners. Yeah, but something that says that Michael isn't really happy about what he's doing. Like, he knows he has to do something so that he can keep the humans around, talk to them in a way that won't seem suspicious. Hmm. But something he's also not happy about doing. Okay. Because even though he's putting on this show, like, boom, yeah, that's such a great roast. Ooh, I really jabbed it in there, you Check know? Check these zingers. <laughs> he doesn't actually seem happy doing it. No, like all his laughter and all his jokes and all his smiles don't seem genuine. No, they're very insincere, which is perfect. It's a good job from Ted. And then we get the great comment about the, you know, the Jacksonville Jaguars. And I just wanted to point this out to anyone who's not on social media or didn't hear about it. This past weekend, Manny Jacinto who plays Jason, actually went to see the Jacksonville Jaguars play in the playoffs. I didn't even know that football was having playoffs right now because that is how much I am into sports. Well, it just doesn't make sense for us as Ontarians in Canada because it's winter and there's a lot of snow around. So yeah, but they're in you Florida. Yeah, exactly. Oh, so yeah. that's why it doesn't make sense to us. Uh, yes, okay. But the Good Place me- social media has had a bunch of pictures of him and videos of him with the team, and it was really kind of cool to see how did you feel about the roast it was not clever mm. what do you mean not clever i don't know like the jokes were very they weren't smart jokes they were just like oh like 
me and Eleanor are so similar. One of us is a demon and who's really cruel, blah, blah, blah. The other's Eleanor, or the other's me. And I don't know, it's just... Do you feel like that's part of the charm? Like <sighs> the roast is really bad? Yeah, I guess. It was just, <laughs> it was just bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, Maybe it's yeah. just because all of the bad place, they don't really... They just... They don't understand nuances of humor. They just hear somebody getting torn down, no matter how good or clever it is. They're just like, oh, they're getting torn down. That's hilarious. Yeah, I can buy that. Yeah. Yeah. I think part of it, too, is that Michael didn't actually want to hurt their feelings that much. So his roasts were not that mean. They were very surface level mean, right? Mm -hmm. Except the one comment about Eleanor loving Chidi, but Chidi not loving her back. That was harsh. Definitely yeah. there to just like jab that knife in a little bit more. Yeah. You know, especially with that previously on where we got Eleanor saying, you know, do you feel that way about me? And Chidi saying no. Like, hello, just smack me in the heart a couple more times. That's fine. <laughs> uh, and then the comment about you died alone because you couldn't commit to anyone. The knock knock joke. Also harsh because... Yeah, true. The truth hurts, right? That's what the roasts are all about. Yeah. Did you see all of the hints as they were first presented to us? No. No? Okay. I didn't see the um, the Tahani one. Mm-hmm, I didn't mm-hmm. quite get that one. I mean, I got the trolley one. It seemed pretty obvious. Yeah. Um, and the Derek one, super obvious. Eleanor's was pretty obvious, too. Like, you belong right here. That oh, seems okay. super obvious to me. Okay. Yeah. It felt like we're doing something with that, but I don't really know what he's trying to tell her either. I just, I didn't get that one as much as you did, I guess. But yeah, the Derek one, the trolley one, and Kierkegaard, obviously. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Tahani's, I didn't really. Yeah, no, I didn't get that one. That one was quite subtle. That was very directed to Tahani. She would understand that you do not do that following a party. But that's a good thing, right? Like, Sure, yeah. Jason's was super obvious because he would get that and he would get annoyed that someone mm. misnamed Blake Bortles, right? So it makes sense. It's, it's good. It did a good job, I think. Michael frames Vicky as an accomplice to the humans and Sean leaves after ordering Michael to erase the neighborhood. As the train full of demons pulls away, it reveals the four humans lying on the tracks. Michael cries, and the five of them discuss their process of figuring out all the clues. With all the demons gone, they might have a chance of getting to the real good place. The episode ends with Derek at Mindy's door with cocaine and a willingness for sex. And that's our episode. That's the episode. Yeah. Yeah. During their flashback, which is so unnecessary. Anyway... (laughs) During their flashbacks is one of my favorite visual gags, and they all have to separate, and they go their own separate ways, and of course, seconds later, they all find themselves together again. Yep. Oh my gosh, that's one of my favorite gags this episode. Everyone is a very sucky conspirator. Yep. Yeah. They're the worst. (laughs) So bad. (laughs) But just the way it's filmed, everybody's acting at that moment, that's just great, you know? Everyone's sort of looking around like... Oh, I'm not suspicious at all. Yep. And Jason's like all ducking and being all, <laughs> oh my gosh. Split up so we don't draw attention. Yeah, you really nailed that one. They might as well just start doing like music. Or whistling. You know, like, like, Kus- uh, they might as well start doing their own background noise like Kronk in Emperor's New Groove. His own theme music. Yeah, exactly. They might as well be doing that. They're that bad at it. Basically, yeah. <laughs> Um, so they meet up at the, the train station. Mm-hmm. If anybody else watches Psych, I'm pretty sure that's the exact same set. Oh, really? As the office in Psych. I looked at pictures, the, the wall, wall trimmings and the paper, the wallpaper and the, the outset three panel window is identical. I'm a hundred percent sure that's the same set. Okay. All right. If you're a big psych fan, let us know. Do you agree with Jason? Are you like, nah, and, and that's it? I'm, I'm, re- 
I'm watching Psych for the first time, so it's been on my mind. So as soon as I saw it, I was like, wait, that looked super familiar. Uh, so okay. I'm pretty sure, pretty sure. Alrighty, alrighty. Okay. But if you send me details, don't spoil anything. I'm mm. only on the end of season three. So we've kind of skirted around this a little bit this episode. Are you not a fan of this one? Nope, not really. Okay. It's basically the episode could have been half its length and have been okay. as successful. Yep, I would agree with you. I think this episode spends too much time explaining itself. Yes. I feel like the writers need to trust their audience a little bit more instead of replaying these old scenes. We had like, the same problems in the first two episodes. Yeah, exactly. We kept getting way too much of a scene instead of just the exact moment we needed, right? I understand the point of flashbacks. I get why we do them because we really do need to sometimes hear that little tidbit again, right? To get it in our mind. But it was just a little too much, you know? We were doing it a lot this episode. Mm -hmm. It was the last, like, seven minutes of the episode. That's pretty much what we were doing. Yeah, it's like... Michael was basically like, so uh, explain in full detail how you figured out all of my clues and what you did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I understand that some of the hints were not that obvious. Like Eleanor's little hint about needing to actually stay in the good place was not super obvious, at least to me. So I get going over them, but I feel like you can do that pretty easily and a lot faster Brevity. they did. Brevity, please. Mm. Yeah. But I did like the moment where they zoom in on Michael as soon as he sees them laying on the tracks and they give us that same music cue that they give you at the end of season one when you get that big reveal. Right before he starts laughing. Exactly. They give us that same cue. So you're like already tensed up wondering, oh God, is this going to like somehow twist in a way I wasn't expecting? But then we get Michael being really sweet and getting emotional, like crying about them. You guys. I was so scared for you guys. You're my friends and I was worried for you. Like, oh, Michael has a heart. It was was really sweet. Okay. It was just very sweet. Well, some would say his heart grew three sizes that day. Oh, just like the Grinch. Very cute. So I like that. I like that they're kind of setting us up for this twist, but then we just get... You know, some actual genuine character development for Michael, Mm -hmm. which I've been missing this season with our humans because the reset kind of brought them back to like early season one characters. Yes, very much so. And so it's nice that at least Michael is definitely moving forward in terms of his character and his ethical growth, his growth as a person. Okay, so you're obviously not a big fan of the flashbacks, but what did you think of the halo effect around michael in all of the memories was it weird it seemed a little cheap okay kind of like what well why are we highlighting michael we know he's the one talking like we know what we're supposed to be listening to mm. mm-hmm. okay it seemed like an odd choice i don't know if they were trying to go for some sort of like angelic thing we never had it for but... any of the other flashbacks no It was an odd visual, and I do wonder if it's going to somehow pay off later. Like, there is some sort of savior-type thing to him. Like, if he ends up saving them, I don't know. It was an odd one. Not a huge fan. Yeah. Don't feel like I need that much help figuring this out. What do you think about Chidi echoing Sean's line in the beginning? This is everything we ever wanted. I like it. Do I think you, it's a good moment. Do you think that that has an impact on Michael at all? Because as soon as they bring that up and like, oh, now you can finally help us get to the good place. His expression. We all saw his expression like, yeah, oh boy. Yeah, his smile does not reach his eyes. Mm-mm. No, um, I like it. I think it's a good moment because the first time we hear it is from Sean, who's just saying... This is what you've always wanted, like, acting like he knows exactly what's in Michael's heart. Bruh, don't tell me what I want. Yeah. And then we get Michael saying it, and he doesn't seem genuine. He seems like he's reckoning with the fact that this isn't what he's always wanted anymore. Mm -hmm. 
And then we get this moment from Chidi, and it is something that he wants. He wants to actually, or as far as we can tell, he wants to bring them to the good place. He wants to get there. It's just I think he's really doubting his ability to do that. Mm-hmm. And his ability to join them if he ever does manage to get them there. Right. So. Three different ways of saying the same line. Exactly. Right? Very different feelings behind each one. So I don't know if you noticed, but in the final scene, when they're all talking, the neighborhood has been, like, completely trashed, right? Graffiti everywhere. Did you notice the graffiti? Oh, yeah. Okay. So the one that I had a hard time seeing, but did eventually find, was hashtag MTGPBA, which, according to Reddit, means make the good place bad again. Really? <laughs> That's the best interpretation I saw, for sure. It makes sense, right? Make the good place bad again. Because hashtag M-A-G-A, make America great again, right? Cool. Yeah. I like it. Okay. And then there was rest in eternal misery, suckas. (laughs) Yep. And for a good time, call your mom. Classic. So this was Michael's trolley problem. Yeah. Okay. Michael's had a few this season. (laughs) Yeah. So he sacrificed Vicky. For the four of them. Yep. I don't think he cared much about Vicky, though, so that wasn't hard for him. Yeah, no. They're not friends. But I do like that he said, when he was talking about Vicky, like, eh, ethically, I don't feel that great about it. But I had to do it. Yeah, that was really that. He did not have to say that whatsoever, but you could tell that was on his mind. Mm Mm-hmm. I like that line. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's a good one. And then we get the end of the episode... With Derek meeting with Mindy for the first time, and Mm -hmm. Mindy got her cocaine! Finally. But it's still a very medium place, though, because she gets, you know, a couple duffel bags full of cocaine, but how long is that going to last for a literal eternity? And she gets Derek. With no sex organs besides wind chimes. Yeah, which, I mean, there's a lot of other stuff you can do. But he's really annoying. Like... If he mostly just says Derek all the time. Yeah. She's going to get annoyed of Derek and like just make him stand outside with all her sunflowers. But at least he keeps him open. You know, it's the possibility that we'll see Derek again. Yeah, we'll see Mindy and Derek happily fighting all the time. Yeah. He went from maximum Derek to medium Derek. Oh, I like that. A little side note too. Clearly whoever wrote the note on Derek... Which might have been one of the actors, might have been like a PA or something, is not a fan of the Oxford comma because it was signed Eleanor, comma, Chidi, comma, Tahani and Jason. And well, I was like, they're together now? They're together, but they still get to be individuals, Jason. Just like you and I respect people. So, final thoughts on this episode? I'd give it a medium, Derek. Out of Maximum Derek. Ooh, I like this rating scale we've got. Yeah, I would say it's a medium Derek. It's kind of a get you there episode, you know? It's like right in the middle. Yeah, I like the characters. Everyone interacts really well. It's just getting to where we need to go took a little bit of time. Yeah, yeah. And it it is a getting you where you need to go episode. I feel like we've had a few of those this season. Yeah, a few. We're not operating on a larger timeline like we were in season one, where it was months. And so between episodes, there was weeks going by. Yeah. This season has been much more tight on the timeline. So we are getting a lot of moments like that. Yeah. So I think it will very much benefit I think going so from start to finish, not waiting three months between an episode or two months. Yeah. It was one month. It was like two. It was like one and a bit. <laughs> one and a bit is basically two okay fine all right shall we get to some of our mail knock knock at the door who's that at the door it's mail for who it's mail for you our first piece of mail comes from kate at i do human things on twitter she said I don't have a shirt ton to say about this mid-season premiere, but I thought I'd send over a thought or two. Meanwhile, she's written like four pages of 
stuff. <laughs> We're going to paraphrase you, Kate. She said, I knew for sure that a scheme was afoot, but that's mostly because the writers have done such a good job of developing Michael as a character and he is one to trust. I agree. I think that this works perfectly. It's not really a twist because it's just been building up all season. Mm -hmm. We know Michael is different now. We know that he's not going to be swayed by a pin with a thumbs down on it. Mm -hmm. Right? Even if it means he's senior staff now. That's not who he is anymore. He doesn't want that. There's so much more to the afterlife than just a position. Right. And he's learning that finally. Kate also says that one thing that I found visually interesting when Eleanor was explaining her clue analysis was the filter over the roast scene, like we mentioned before. They've grayed everything other than Michael, who has sort of a full body halo on. If I recall, the show has not done anything quite like that in flashbacks. Hmm, great minds think alike, Kate. Yeah. So my cogs are turning on that one. Obviously, halos have their implications. Could it perhaps signify that demons can become angels through good deeds? Is Michael half angel? Like the movie Little Nicky with Adam Sandler. And that's why he has the capacity for change? I kind of doubt they'd call the good place ones angels, but bear with me for the purpose of the discussion. Or did they think it would look neat and keep our focus on the clue giver? Video games have certainly done that, so this is definitely a possibility. And of course, there's always the possibility that it's just an Eleanor perspective thing, and she's like in love with Michael or something. Please no. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we agree. Please no. <laughs> Please no. Logically, this plan of theirs at the end is very flawed, but I think learning ethics is making Michael a little bit less calculated. And to be frank, he didn't do a great job calculating when designing the original Good Place. Very true. Mm-hmm. Because he didn't understand people. Yeah. So as far as the Halo thing, like we did talk a little bit about that earlier in the episode, but yeah, I think it could lead into something later. I'm wondering if it's sort of a Michael has transformed now. He's becoming a better person. That halo is kind of there now. Um, It is kind of an odd visual. And it is coming from Eleanor. So I don't know if that means something. But I'm inclined to just believe that it was more of a video game type of thing. You know? Just uh, purely for visual. Purely for visual sake. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Which is a bit of a disappointment, if it is. So, oh well, we'll see. And of course, this plan is totally flawed, right? Like, he's putting in all these little hints, but he has zero idea if they're actually going to get them. He hopes that they will, but you can see by the end, like, he says, I was so scared for you. You know, I was so scared because I didn't know if you were going to get it. (laughs) Yeah. Because if he really trusted that nothing would go wrong and they would totally be able to figure out all the clues, I don't think he would have started crying as soon as he saw them. (laughs) Kate also says, This season thus far is very Michael development based and I'm excited to see where it leads us. Either way, it seems unlikely that they can get away with just living in the abandoned good place, but we shall see. And really, no one looked back on the train to see them standing up on the newly vacant train tracks? Yeah, I don't know. Everybody was drunk. I I forgive them for that one. But I am wondering, like, are they going to actually stay in the abandoned good place? Is that their plan at the moment? Well, they only have a day, according to Sean. Yeah. He's like, I want this erased. So Sean's going to notice if it doesn't just pop out of existence. Can Janet take them to her void? Ooh. A whole episode in the void. You know what? That might be kind of expensive now that I think about it. Because a lot of green screen is probably involved. Unless the whole screen's just black the entire time. Mm, yeah, but no. It looked and like Janet's void was eyeballs. all white. Or wait, that was like the storage pocket dimension between accounting and something else, right? Right. Okay. All right. Thanks, Kate, for your message. Our next email comes from Kathleen. Kathleen says, What's up, my good pals? It's good to be back. The semester for my philosophy requirement, I'm taking moral philosophy. And if you don't think it's because I want to be a real-life cheaty and a Gagne, then you're a dang fool. <laughs> good job, Kathleen. We hope you're having fun in that class. Yeah, like, 
literally have like fun. so much fun like so much th- fun thinking about moral dilemmas honestly moral dilemmas are fun to think about i get it i get it mm-hmm. our first class was yesterday and our professor informed us that our first reading will be the last days of socrates and our first paper will be an analysis of the discussion between socrates and crito <laughs> we're assuming that's how you pronounce that <laughs> On whether or not it is ethical for Socrates to escape prison, where he is awaiting his death sentence, Credo says that since it is unjust that Socrates is imprisoned, it is his moral responsibility to escape. Socrates says that to break one law is to break all of them, and decides to stay in prison and be executed rather than become an outlaw. As a professor and Socrates enthusiast, Chidi would know about this, so I wonder what his thought process is like in trying to escape eternal damnation. Maybe he's working with the doctrine of double effect, because in order to continue learning and teaching ethics, he must escape the bad place. Well, we've seen before that Chidi is clearly a big fan of Kant, right? Who always is saying who's always saying that you can't break any law, because breaking any law means breaking all laws, and it means that everybody can do all of that, right? So I think That's that what... Chidi is definitely grappling with whether or not he should be doing this, but also knowing this is bad. This is not a good situation. This is not a moral situation either. So the rules on Earth don't apply in the same way, right? He knows, like you said, Kathleen, he knows that he has to escape the bad place if he wants to continue learning and teaching ethics and living his life right this is kind of a matter of survival if he doesn't get out of this fake good place he's going to be sent to the real bad place and there literally will never be hope for him experiencing happiness again so i think he's just okay with it kathleen continues to say in this newest episode of the good place i was thinking about the weight of the phrase everything i slash we ever wanted Michael's promotion was everything he ever wanted, but he knew he had to help his friends. At the end, when Chidi says this is everything they ever wanted, Michael has a pained expression on his face, like maybe he's thinking about what he's given up, or how he's become an outlaw, and how it's unlikely he'll ever get into the real good place. I super, super want to hear your thoughts on this, especially about whether it's ethical for Chidi to break celestial laws by trying to escape his fate. Love you, have fun recording, and can't wait to listen. (laughs) <laughs> thanks kathleen okay so like i mentioned just a moment ago i think that it's fine for chidi to break celestial laws i suppose because this entire system really needs to be uprooted it needs to be confronted because it's just completely unfair um so I think it's actually more ethical for him to be breaking the rules than not breaking them at this point. Shake up the system and... And fight for a better afterlife. Fight for justice for all these people in the bad place that really aren't bad people. Mm -hmm. Like the four of them. Right. So, that's my opinion on that one. What do you think, Jason? No, that makes total sense. It's it's tough for Chidi to try and think about earthly philosophy and philosophers and morality when they're not on earth and they don't know what the laws and the rules are that govern the good places and the bad places and this system. So I think it's okay for him to kind of mix things up a bit. Forge his own path? Yeah. Okay. He can become... One of the most important philosophers of the afterlife. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Oh, years from now, people will be studying Chidi and Agonia's work. Yeah, the Book of Chidi. Yeah, I like that. And it will have an awful title. Oh, God, it will have a title that just goes on forever. So many semicolons. Just a necessary amount of sem- semicolons. All right, thank you, Kathleen. Our next message comes from Alan at Chipper Alan on Twitter. Now, this was the message that he sent to us a little while ago, but it is the first podcast we've done of 2018, so we are getting to you now. Sorry about the delay. He said, Is Janet morally responsible for Derek as his creator? 
Derek can't care for himself and he has no power. But is he a person? If not, is there an obligation? Okay, interesting questions. Hmm. What do you think, Jason? Derek, to me, seems a lot more like Janet of season one. Just following instructions, rules, orders. But not as well as Janet. No, not nearly as well. No. But... (laughs) But do you think that that makes Janet morally responsible for Derek as his creator? Like, is she responsible for the choices that he makes and the actions that he does? No. Is anybody responsible for the actions and the choices that their parents or their creators make for them? Some might say yes. Some might say that God is responsible morally for our actions as human beings. Free will. Yeah. I mean, that's a nice friggin' get out of jail free card for him, isn't it? Mm hmm. <laughs> it's not my responsibility. It's totally free will. Well, like our parents <laughs> are our creators, mm-hmm. technically. Mm-hmm. They're not responsible for the way we, we act. Yeah. Does Janet have an obligation to Derek? The situation is different, of course. Yeah. I think she does. Mm-hmm. Because he's basically like, well, he is literally her creation. She has to have him on a leash. Mm-hmm. But at the end of this episode, we see that she just lets him go off to Mindy's place to be a willing sex slave, apparently, which immediately made me feel a little uncomfortable. And I did not say anything at the body of this episode, but uh, yeah. I yeah, have no problem it, with this. I don't know. It just kind of... Uh, Derek anyway. is literally... He has no... At this point in his existence, he's just an autonomous robot who is like cool with everything. Yeah. I mean, most of his responses are just Derek. Yeah. He's less of a person in this episode than he was in the previous one. Right. Because he's in like hibernation or sleep mode. Yeah. He's been very much dumbed down. Yeah. I wonder if Janet's like inebriation affected Derek. And maybe that's the reason he kept responding with, Ooh, Derek. Ooh, Derek. Maximum Derek. Like, was he doing that because he was also kind of drunk? He was saying just Derek before. Like, when he was in, when Janet put him in the trunk at the end of... No, he was like, bye, mommy, girlfriend, and I'll miss you guys. See you later. And right. then he said Derek times. But then, times. when she put him in the trunk, she had to put him into sleep mode or, like, hibernation mode, shutting off most of his brain. Right. So you feel like she just left him in that state? Yeah. Definitely. Uh, okay. All right. I don't know. I guess it still feels a little weird. I don't think she could have taken him out of the, his, that state because she was on magnets. Right. So she wouldn't have been able to. But maybe if she wasn't drunk on magnets, then she would have been able to take him out of that state. Yeah. But she was... They had to send him off to Mindy's. Totally derricked out of his mind. Yeah. I don't know. I just... I want someone else to weigh in here. So please do if you're listening. Um, How did you feel about... Derek becoming the willing sex slave at the end of the episode. Did it make you uncomfortable? Was it fine? You didn't think about it. Maybe you didn't even think about it before I mentioned it right now. (laughs) So, it's very possible. Thank you, Alan, for your um, questions. Our next message comes from Fred Firestein on FF Firestein on Twitter. He said, how do we know if Jason is dumb and should know better or is mentally handicapped? We see dummies on TV all the time, and I wonder when it crosses the line. Go Jacksonville Jaguars, I guess. <laughs> okay. So, Jason is obviously super dumb. Yeah. He's always been really stupid. But to me, he's never crossed the line into being, you know, developmentally delayed or anything like that. I'm sure he. it's very likely he has learning disability. Yeah, but... That's very different, though. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He did make a comment in... I believe it was episode five of this season where he says something like, oh, I've been there, man, Um, in regards to Michael having his existential crisis, saying like, oh, he snorted or he sniffed a bunch of printer toner and he's got about like 70% of his brain power left. So part of me wonders if it's just like, I don't know, 
Jason was dropped on his head as an infant. Jason took a few too many drugs as an adolescent. I don't know. Sniffed a little bit too much glue. Yeah, it's possible. But I would just say it's mostly a joke, and he's Mm. just kind of a dumb guy. Yeah. I think if a character on a show is supposed to be mentally handicapped or developmentally disabled, they will tell you. Yeah, they're they'll make, make it, it obvious. Very obvious. Yeah, I think so too. And I don't think that they would make that person into a joke. No. Because then it's kind of insulting. A little bit. So, yeah. I'm just going to stick with Jason's just dumb. Okay, thanks for your question. Our last comment is from Janine at Janine 5 by 5 on Twitter. I'm hoping that's a Faith reference. It most certainly is. I know Janine. She loves Faith. And Buffy. She said, I'm not into Jason and Tahani either, but I do like seeing them feature Jason's kindness and tenderness with her, as well as Tahani's carefree side, instead of them just being monsters all the time. Not that I don't want to see Eleanor and Tahani run around like monsters together, because that I am into. Like a Spike Drusilla sort of way. You know, loving each other monstrously and hating everybody else gleefully. Okay, cool. Yeah, I like that you mentioned Jason's kindness, his tenderness, Tahani's more carefree side. We do get a little bit of sweetness between Jason and Tahani during the roast. Because both of of them are like giving each other little touches yeah they're kind of holding each other like reassuring each other like it's okay yeah we care about each other yeah and tahani holds jason's hand when michael is roasting her and then jason you know puts his hand on tahani's back kind of leans into her when she's the one getting the roast like they're being there they're comforting each other it's nice i don't like tahani's comment about how he's not allowed to weigh in because he doesn't have the processing capacity for it i think that that's rude well at that point it's like tahani's reverting to her her old self and she hasn't really grown and she's kind of forgetting her lessons that she's been learning Mm Hmm. yeah that was a little bit of a backslide i'd say yeah but being supportive of each other was at least nice in that moment Wish it would just happen all the time. <laughs> yeah, I definitely watch a spinoff of Eleanor and Tahani rampaging through the city, just ripping on people. Oh, yeah. I mean, they could be best friends if they could just stop disliking each other. No, 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 no. That adds to the fun. Ah, okay. It's like a mutual... Like a buddy cop, but they don't like each other? Yeah, they don't really get along, but they have to work together Ooh. to be terrible I watch people. that. Yeah. And Tahani's entire time she's just like i'm so sorry about her (laughs) i'm so sorry (laughs) she just apologizes for everything eleanor does yeah yeah i could see that all right thanks janine okay do we have any final comments questions inquiries hopes desires for things that will happen i hope the next i hope the next few episodes of the season are less pandery Okay. And I desire more episodes that are less pandery. <laughs> oh, goodness. You're really stuck on that, eh? Let me just explain it a few more times in case our listeners didn't get it. Oh, I get it. Okay, let's just... Let's do a flashback. Flashbacks. Many flashbacks. <laughs> do a little reversal there. Oh, my goodness. That was terrible. Okay. Yeah. I'm excited to see how they're going to end this season. I really want... To see them go somewhere else, I think. I think it would just be interesting to see them get out of this fake good place, you know? I did see some promo images. I didn't, no spoilers. That brings us to the end of Fork and Bullshirt, a Multiverse Radio production. If you like the show, please leave a rating and review on iTunes. This is the best way for others to find the show. If you want to get in touch with us, we're on Twitter at Multiverse Radio and on Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast. You can also email us directly from our website, multiverseradio.ca. We'll see you next week for our review of Season 2, Episode 10, Best Self. Bye. Bye. Continuing on. Nonfiction? Documentary? Obviously, not nonfiction. It can't be not... Shush. Um, (laughs) During the mid-season final... Oh, yes. Slurp it up. Slurp it up! (sighs) (sighs) Oh, my God. (sighs) 
This is the episode of the Black Mirror. <laughs> the Black Mirror. <laughs> that sounded much more serious. <laughs> the Black Mirror. That sounded like a Disney... Not fairy tale? What's a... N- oh my god. What's a, what's a not fairy tale? <laughs> what's a not fairy tale? A nightmare? A Disney nightmare. Whatever. This has been, it's been a long week and it's only hump day. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Darcy Cardigan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Going away from the good place fashion wash. Wash? I meant to say fast. Fat. Fa- <laughs> you can't say fashion! Okay. Oh, fucking hell. Never mind. I didn't say any of that right. That we makes sense. We got, like, hockey going on, right? I don't even know. Uh, don't do even we have know. hockey? <laughs> I don't know, do we? <laughs> I mean, I know there's hockey out there. Somewhere, someone the, is playing hockey. The national, like, Timbit finals or something? Oh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> totally. Good place, over. It has been such a good place. Oh, God. It may be the real good place was the friends they made along the way. They were in the good place the whole time. Yep. <laughs> That's so sweet. All right, Michael, better sure, not you be can, how it ends. <laughs> Michael, you can send us a check. Like you know our address. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> We're such good buds. That's good. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, they're right off the top of this noggin. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> this is what you get when you tune in. It's not that good. <laughs> <laughs> you better quit while you're ahead. <laughs> yep. <laughs> our first piece of mail comes from Kate at I Do Human Things on Twitter. She doesn't do human things on Twitter. I mean, she does. But her handle is just at I do human things. Okay. (laughs) You can put that in the loopers because she will like that. Okay. Our next message comes from Fred Firestein on Twitter at FF. And how fucking fuck fuck my fucking life. Okay. I guess that brings us to the end of Fork and Bullshit. Well, don't say I guess. I guess? That sounds haphazard. Just say it. Is it haphazard? Yeah. It's not haphazardly? No, it's haphazard. I thought PH together was a f. It's haphazard. What's a hap? <laughs>